So yeah, in teaching myself a lot of things, I've had to kind of think about how I learn. Um, so Flatiron School would teach people how to code, get them jobs, that's it. Um, so Fred Wilson is a venture capitalist. I've been reading his blog my entire life. I happen to love the guy, but that thing, what he said about learning to code and teaching himself how to code when he was in high school, that's how I feel about that, okay? <laughs> uh, it is not easy. It was in fact like teaching myself how to code when I was growing up was easily the darkest time of my life. I was just in my parents' basement at like three in the morning when everyone else was going out and having fun and doing whatever else kids do in high school and I'm like trying to figure out PHP. It sucked. It was like super, super, super hard and I don't think learning to code is easy. Um, so the first thing that I think is really important is to actually like really try to fall in love with code and I think everyone is a little bit different about like what makes them fall in love with something. For me, I love history and you can see like all around the school like Alan Turing is like a huge inspiration to me, um, Grace Hopper, you know, all of them. So whether it's like the culture of programming or just the absolute like wonder of code, like um, I'm sure you've uh, watched Netflix in your bed on a laptop, right? Just realize at that moment that the very thing you're watching is also flying around your face because that's how information works, right? The information had to go from your like Wi-Fi router to your computer and there's no magic, despite what we just learned from Yana's talk. Um, and uh, electromagnetic waves are basically pulsating at a certain bit rate um, that can then get back compiled into the video you're watching. And like, I love that, the wonder of technology. So fall in love with it. It'll make the process easier because when it gets hard and when you feel like, I'm so stupid, this sucks, actually loving what you're doing will help you get through that. Um, in fact, I've given a whole talk on 20 things I love about programming. Um, it's on YouTube. Just remember that. Memorize that, okay? Um, you can watch it. It's a, I think it's an okay talk. Um, all right, so uh, my friend Nate Westheimer, who was kind of like an idea person for like his most of his life, one day realized that he can't really start startups or be in tech if he doesn't know how to code. And he wrote a blog post about teaching, teaching himself how to code. He called it the sweat lodge method. He basically locked himself in a room for six months and taught himself how to code. Um, that picture is from one of our first students at Flatiron before he knew he was going to get accepted. He basically planned out his sweat lodge approach. Um, so you want to kind of think of what you're trying to learn and make a holistic approach to learning. Otherwise, you're just going to be like grabbing and at straws. So uh, I think you should first pick a language and stick with it. It really doesn't matter whether it's PHP or Ruby or JavaScript. Your first language won't matter, but just don't switch once you've made a decision. Okay. That being said, make Ruby your first language. Okay. Um, I think that just understanding some basic like command line stuff, like what is a file, how to CD, you know, the terminal, that you have to start there. And I think the Code Academy command line stuff is really great for that. Um, you're going to have to set up an environment. Um, I think the Learn IDE gives you one. Otherwise, there's like C9 or just set it up locally. But you have to have like a programming environment. You have to start thinking of your computer as like your tool. It's no longer the thing you use to like, you know, tweet or face page or whatever. It is now like your craft, like a hammer that you want to like be perfect. Um, then make yourself a syllabus. So like figure out what you're trying to learn. I want to learn Ruby and I want to, you know, you can Google like learning syllabuses, but have a plan that is, you know, months long. Your first goal I think should be to build a command line application. It's way a simpler interface than like trying to build a mobile app or a web app first. Um, you'll learn what a command line application is. Then move to web application. Um, I think consistency is like super important. Um, I've watched a lot of students try to program once a week. So they'll be like, I'm going to code all day on Saturday, but the rest of the week I don't do anything. That's not a great strategy. I think it's way better to do like an hour a day than try to like do 10 hours in a weekend. Mostly because you're going to forget what you learned last weekend every weekend. So if you do an hour a day, it'll stay fresh. Um, don't ever stop. That's like the most important thing. Um, you know, if you're, if you're tired of like starting over, uh, stop quitting. Um, and I watch a lot of people being like, yeah, I've been trying to learn how to code for years. You know, I, I, I spend a month doing it, then I get really frustrated and I give up. Just don't stop. Once you start, continue no matter what. Um, and then also, ignore your programmer friends. They're going to tell you a bunch of stuff like about Mongo and React and Redux and why you should learn this and why you should learn why. Their opinions don't apply to you because they are at a way different level. Um, so programmer friends will constantly tell you things about you're doing wrong or you're learning the wrong thing or no one uses that framework. Ignore them, okay? Just pick a language, learn it really well, and don't stop. 
don't worry about whether or not what you're learning is the best thing to learn, okay? Um, and then when you're actually working on a project, I think you need uh, kind of like a more micro approach to it. Um, and I think like writing a to-do of what you're trying to do is really important. Um, I think that like trying to think about how what you're actually trying to do and describe it in plain English really works. Um, I tend to ask myself a lot of questions like, how is this method going to work? What objects am I going to create? And kind of just write those out. If I have questions at first, then the answers come to me a little better than when I'm just like programming an entire like ambiguity. Um, I think a lot about what I know about the problem, what I don't know about the problem, and what I'm going to learn about the problem. So like. I spent a lot of time on the subway. In fact, coming here, I ended up in Brooklyn by accident. Um, but the subway is a great place to just really think about what you're going to work on once you get out of the subway. Um, and I, like, I don't know, it's like a meditation to me. I really try to like write the same to-do list over and over and over again and see how consistent it is. Um, work in sprints. Uh, there's something called the Pomodoro method, which basically, you know, you set a timer for 15 minutes, you work, then you take a, take a little walk. I think that works really effectively. Um, don't try to just like code for eight hours straight. Take breaks and like give yourself a timer. 45 minutes, 10 minute break. 45 minutes, 10 minute break. That works way better. Um, use Git. It's a version control. You'll be able to go back and forward really easily. Um, keep your project and code organized. Um, I, I, like, I'm a little OCD and if I have like 40 files open and a whole bunch of random gibberish and comments in my code, I just get really lost. Um, just try to actually keep your code like pristine. Um, that means well indented code. When you, you know, I write a lot of comments, but once I get something working, I delete those comments because they kind of, you know, mess up my code. If you build one version of a method and then another version of a method, delete the one that you don't need anymore, but like keep your code clean. It's way easier to work in like a clean project than like a whole bunch of random files and messy codes. Um, I've watched beginners work on like eight things at a time. I just don't get it. Like for me, I'm working on one line of code, one method, one object, one class, one file, one project. I do not work on 10 things at once. Um, so really try to work on one unit at a time. Um, yeah, get feedback. Like I, I watch a lot of people write a lot of code and then run it like two hours later. That's inefficient. You're not going to get like Programming is free, trying things is free. Um, I think you should write one line of code, run your program, run your tests, get feedback and see what it changed. We're gonna talk a lot more about that. And um, I tend to talk to myself when I'm programming to the point where like people sitting next to me are like, what are you doing? But the way I like to stay focused and let, is just basically narrating to myself out loud what I'm currently doing. When you speak out loud, your brain is processing information in a different way. When you verbalize stuff, you tend to understand it better. It is a magical thing how focused and better you'll be if you just constantly are describing to yourself out loud what you are trying to do. Trust me. I know it looks weird. It's really, really effective. Um, so <laughs> I love this one. <laughs> Debugging is an interesting thing um, because a lot of people think that uh, it's their fault that their program is broken. Um, the natural state, the default state of every program is broken. It is not your fault. Um, if it worked, you would be done programming. So debugging to me is actually programming, right? I want to create errors. I want to make a mess. Getting out of it is how I make my program work. So when you're learning, I think what you're actually trying to learn is how to debug effectively. It is the number one skill of programmers is, is the ability to figure out why is this broken, what's going on, and debugging is really it. Um, this is the rubber duck debugging method, which is, you can read the Wikipedia article, it's interesting, but a programmer once uh, basically put a duck on her desk and started talking to it about what was wrong and found that that was an effective way to debug, which again speaks a lot to verbalization. So when I have a problem, I want to speak out loud about it because by having to say it out loud, my brain is going to process it and understand it better. Do that. Get a rubber duck. It's really cute. <laughs> All right. We're going to go through a whole bunch of debugging tips, okay? Um, I think that debugging is about observing changes, right? If you change 30 lines of code at a time and then run your program, you're going to get a new error, but you're not going to know what change you made caused that error. You make one change and then you run your program and then you see what happened. 
because you want to be able to observe how what you've done changed the state or the execution of the program. The less changes you make at a time, the better it'll be. I also see a lot of beginners like look at their code for an hour thinking what they're going to try. Don't do that. Trying things is free. Try one thing, run your program, then try another thing. Like, don't overthink it. Um, you want to try stuff, but you want to be disciplined about how you try things. So one thing at a time, run your program, get new feedback. Um, error messages are your friend, okay? They are not trying to screw you. They are literally telling you what is broken. Read the error messages. I know they sound like gibberish at first, but there's actually, they're pretty descriptive about what's going on. They're not lying to you. This is a student a few days ago that was having an issue with their application and uh, you know there's this whole backtrace, the errors were kind of obfuscated, they weren't sure what was going on, everything was broken. But look, if you read that error message, PG undefines table. Now I don't understand why Postgres calls a table a relation in the <laughs> relation cafes does not exist. I don't get why Postgres calls a table a relation, whatever, but PG undefined table, that sounds like a hint. Maybe the table doesn't exist. Run your migrations. <laughs> so like, read the error messages. I know they sound like wonky, but they generally are telling you exactly what's wrong. I think of an error message, like you know when you see a puzzle piece, it has its contours and you can imagine what the other puzzle piece must look like. There's kind of a positive space and a negative space. That's how I think about error messages. They are the negative space of your problem. They are telling you, if you put a piece that fits like this in there, this will go away, okay? And that's why test-driven development is really useful, because you're constantly getting errors that inform your next step. Run your code. <laughs> like, open up IRB, open up a debugger, something, copy your method, but actually run your code. I don't, like, watching people program without actually running their code is, like, astonishing to me. <laughs> um, so do that. Okay, we're going to talk about this. Replace abstract values with literal values to simplify. Um, once I was giving a talk and someone asked me, why are there errors in, program, in programming? Like, why do, why do bugs happen? And I thought about that, and the reason why bugs happen is because when we're, when we're programming, we're operating at a really abstract level. We don't actually know the values of any of our variables or of our arguments. Only when the code actually compiles do those abstract ideas become literal. You are constantly littering your code with assumptions. This is going to be a number. This is going to be an object. It's going to respond to this method. It's going to have this return value. This conditional will trigger when this happens. Those assumptions might be wrong. What you want to basically do is figure out a way to remove a lot of the assumptions so that you can focus on the thing you don't know. So think about trying to figure out um, who's, who is current, what, who the current player in tic-tac-toe is, right? You're going to basically build two methods. One that's called a current player that should return X or O, and one that's called a turn count that should return how many turns have gone. Because you know if it's an even turn, it should be X. If it's an odd turn, it should be O. The problem with turn count is that you don't know what the board is going to be. So I have the turn count method accepting an argument, but you see what I've done on the first line? Now I 100% know what that method should return. I've replaced an abstract value, the board might be anything, with a literal value. That way I can focus on the logic of how do I count how many turns have gone. And I've stubbed out. I know for sure those are zero turns. Does that make sense? And then the current player method becomes way easier because I know what it should return. It's no longer abstract, it's literal. That's a really useful debugging te technique. And then I would do it again. I would have another board, this time with one turn, and then I know that the current player should turn O. Okay? Um, use a debugger. So, again, because things are ambiguous when we're writing code, what you really want to learn how to do is jump into your code as it's running and look around. Um, I tend to think of like programs as really like having like a three-dimensional object space. And what I want to do is jump into that universe and be like, what's this value and what's that value and what's this method doing? And you want to be able to look around as your program is running. And every programming language has some way to do that. So this is a method called myFind, which is basically re-implementing detect or select or find in Ruby. 
And you can look at this method, and basically, it's a simple loop. We start with an iterator, we start the loop, and then I want to return the value that matches the condition we send it. So if I'm saying one, two, three, I want to return the first even number, and I'm getting back one. Why am I getting back one? That doesn't make any sense. Like, all the logic feels right. One is in that array, so is it just, is the one dot even wrong? Like, I'm not sure what's going on here. This is weird. And because, basically, it's in a loop, I don't know really what's going on. What I basically want to figure out then is where to cut. I need to debug this. And I think, like, you want to think like a surgeon, right? Where am I going to put the debugger? You want to put it as close to the problem as possible, where all the values will exist, and then you can basically insert your debugger, whether it's pry or the debugger in JavaScript, and then look around. And if I think of that line of code, I think of it as like, again, a three-dimensional space. And I want to know what is collection, what is yield collection i returning, what is i. I want to basically know what the actual values of everything that's going on in this program that are, that's really abstract when I write it. I want to know what the literal values are. So this is what my debugging session would be like. I run my, my method. And then the first loop goes, i is 0, which makes sense. It's the first iteration. I look at collection i. It's the number 1. I look at yield collection i. I get back false because i1 is not even. I exit so that the next iteration can, can loop. i is now 1, which makes sense. It's the, first, it's the next iteration in the loop. Collection i is 2. That's the second number in my, in my array. Yield collection is true, which means that 2 is even, why is it not returning 2? Well, it's because I was returning i as the value of um, my method when I should be returning collection, dot, collection i, the actual element that made that true, not the, the loop count. Right? So that's kind of how I think of debugging, right? of why a debugger is useful. Because I can jump into the loop as it's running and see what all the values are and know that the right return value there should have been collection i, not i. Cool? Awesome. Um, which is really about also confirming return values. Right, so like here, there, I'm basically, by saying return collection i, I'm returning the right value for this method, the element that made that statement true, as opposed to the iterator count. Okay? Um, yeah, oh my god, write out in plain English what you're trying to do. I do this all the time. Um, I was working on like a bracket generator for a program, and like, I just needed to know, like, given these literal values, this is what I expect to generate. So sometimes I write pseudocode, sometimes I write massive to-do lists where I just ask myself a ton of questions, how am I going to know this is going to work, what is the rule set, but like describe to yourself what you are trying to do. Not having a plan, and it's really easy to get lost, not having a plan basically puts you in this weird place where like you actually don't know where you are. Um, I started uh, rock climbing recently, and <laughs> rock climbing is a lot like programming, because it's like a 300 foot wall, and there's no way you know how you're gonna get up all of it when you start. And it's very pretty often that like you're 100 foot up a wall, and you're like, uh, how do I, where do I go now? And you just kind of have to like reach around and like plan your approach a little bit. And like that's the only way to get up, but there's no way to know where you're going unless you have like a plan to begin with. Um, yeah, go slow. Uh, <laughs> you wanna like, when, when I know there's a problem, I want to like stop everything and really focus on it. Like people tend to panic when they get errors and you're like, oh my god, this is broken, I don't know what's going on, I'm going to try a hundred things, I'm going to not read error messages. But like when I'm really confused, I try to slow myself down and really think about what am I doing, what might be wrong, read the error messages, but like go slow. Um, you need to adjust your approach. You have to try different things. If you keep on trying the exact same thing, you're going to get the exact same error. You want to get new errors. New errors feel like you're still doing nothing, but that's progress. They're telling you more about what's wrong, what you need to do. Keep it simple. Um, like, it's so... I can't tell you about how many, the t how many times I've overcomplicated really simple stuff because I'm debugging, things are broken, I start panicking, I'm introducing new objects and new variables and new conditionals, and suddenly a method that started as three lines is like 40 lines and uses a whole bunch of objects, and it's so much harder to debug. So just like, try to keep it simple. You should be able to really think about like, the simplest thing you can do, get that right, and then compose it back together. Um, and eventually you're gonna need to get more help. 
which is the next part of the talk. How to get help when you are programming, okay? So, first, Googling. You are going to use Google. It's your best friend. It's not cheating, okay? Um, it boggles my mind that uh, in programming interviews, you're not allowed to use Google. Like, I've always fantasized about going to a programming interview, getting asked a question and being like, can I Google it? And having them tell me no, and then me being able to ask, um, do you not let your developers use Google? <laughs> Get really good at Google. Do not just copy and paste your code into the search engine, okay? It's very unlikely that Google knows exactly what your code is, okay? You wanna learn how to phrase things as questions. I love asking Google things like, how to collect modified elements from an array, Ruby. So the last word of my, of, it will always be the programming language. Um, and I try not to be literal about like, why is collect not working, but rather kind of generic about what am I trying to do? The more abstract you can tell Google about your problem, the more likely you are to get a good result. Um, people tend to just immediately open up Stack Overflow. I think Stack Overflow is really useful, but as a beginner, you don't want Stack Overflow. You want tutorials. You want blog posts about topics. Sure, that might take a little longer to get you the exact thing you're looking for, but you're going to read a whole bunch of other useful information, right? When you read an entire blog post about arrays or collect or yields or blocks in Ruby, yeah, all you wanted to do is figure out how to return a modified element from an array. But you're going to learn a whole bunch of other things, like relish that opportunity, right? You're going to start knowing bloggers and knowing, like, you know, do I like Vidahe's writing? Do I like SitePoint tutorials? Those are useful, okay? Don't just open Stack Overflow. Look for blog posts, look for tutorials. Um, you have to kind of modulate between whether your query is specific or general. Sometimes copying an error message like PG undefined table would work in Google. That is a very specific query. But sometimes you want to kind of be a little more general. So like think about is what I'm asking Google general or specific? If the general query didn't give you what you wanted, try something more specific. Um, yeah, I like to, when I'm really lost, uh, I, I will basically open the like four blog posts on the first page of results in four different tabs and read them all. I think getting different perspectives on the same issue is a really useful way to learn. Everyone is going to explain a concept in a slightly different way, and one of those is going to really click for you. And again, like I try to surround myself with knowledge. So like if I open up the Ruby documentation or the Ruby API for Array, and I'm looking for, hmm, what is select return when it can't find an element? I'll also read the method above select and the method below select. That way, like, as long as I opened up some documentation, let me just get familiar with not just the method I'm looking for, but one or two other methods. Um, and then no, point number six is really important. You can literally Google how to Google effectively, okay? <laughs> there are tons of articles about how to use Google better. Try it. Um, I, I don't know when people stopped reading books. <laughs> But I love programming books. Um, it was kind of a desperation for me because when I was in high school trying to teach myself how to code, like the wonderful resources we have now, like Code Academy, didn't exist. There was a site called WebMonkey that was kind of helpful. But basically, if you want to learn how to code, the internet was still pretty nascent. There wasn't a lot of material. I would go to Barnes & Noble's after school, and I would sit in the stacks, and I would read programming books. And I'd come back the next day and read the same book, and the next day and again and again. Eventually, I realized, because I couldn't really, programming books are expensive, they're like $40. If you're like a 15-year-old kid in the Bronx, you can't afford that. But uh, I did learn that you could rip out the CD in the back of the book and walk, <laughs> <laughs> and walk out of the store with that and then read it in the library. Um, but yeah, I would read a programming book over and over and over again. Um, I, the first time I read a programming book, I'd maybe understand 10% of it. The next time I read it, I'd understand maybe 20%. And eventually, after reading it like five or six times, it started clicking. Just read programming books. Get a good beginner programming book, like Programming Ruby, The Well-Grounded Rubyist, J JavaScript, The Definitive Guide, whatever. But read programming books. They're awesome, okay? They're literally the best programmers in the world telling you what they know, okay? <laughs> um, the YouTube search engine is amazing. You can find a lecture on anything. How to rock climb, how to fly a plane, how nuclear reactors work. Use the YouTube search engine. You will find lectures on every single topic. Again, that's not going to give you the exact answer to your exact problem right now. But as a beginner, your goal is not to just always solve the exact problem you have right now. It is to learn. 
Watching a one hour programming talk, even if only five minutes of it are exactly what you needed, one day in your life, those other 55 minutes will come in useful, okay? So use that. Um, okay, let's talk about Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is awesome. It's the coolest thing in the world. I love it. Basically, you put in anything into Google, you're going to get a Stack Overflow answer. Some things you should know about it. Their code is not your code. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen someone copy the answer from Stack Overflow into their program, hit save, and then click run. That makes no sense. Their variables are not your variables. What you have to learn is to contextualize what they're saying to how your program actually works. And you need to take their code and like modify it to actually apply to your program. You cannot just copy and paste from Stack Overflow, okay? Um, Stack Overflow also <laughs> can give you like 60 answers to the easiest question in the world. Do not try all of them. Try one of them and get it working. If one doesn't work, don't just go to the next one. Try to get that first one to work, okay? So like, don't get lost in the answers. There will be 100 answers to every question. Pick the one that has the most upvotes and make that one work. The other 99 are basically doing the exact same thing. Um, yeah, and again, I always think about, is the thing I'm trying to debug or learn general or specific? The more general it is, like, um, you know, how do arrays work in Ruby, the less useful Stack Overflow is. Stack Overflow is really, really useful for, like, edge cases, specific, really, really, really specific problems. But if you're misunderstanding something and don't, just don't know about the topic in general, Stack Overflow is not your friend, okay? Like, I don't know, it's like the difference between, like, um, like a really specific medicine that cures, is, that cures just one disease and, like, vitamins, right? So Stack Overflow is great, but like be aware of what you're, if, if where you're at and what you don't understand is general or specific. If it's general, you want blog posts, you want lectures, you want books. If it's specific, Stack Overflow is helpful. All right. People ask me for help a lot, okay? I need help helping you, okay? I need you to tell me more about your problem, okay? Why this doesn't work is not a helpful question. I don't know what this is, and I don't know what you're trying to do. So when you ask for help, you know, there are amazing communities. There's Code Newbies, there's the Learn Slack, there's Free Code Camp. There are meetups, there are a ton of chat rooms, forums where people will help you program. When you ask for help, you have to describe what you are working on. I'm trying to build an Airbnb clone, it's a Rails app, I'm having a really hard time with these associations. Here is a link to my code, to my repository, I've put it up on GIST. I, I mean, listen, I love people, but <laughs> Please stop pasting like 30 line methods with no syntax highlighting into Slack. It's very hard to follow, okay? Make a gist of it. Like, it's so much easier for me to read it. Link me to your repo. It's hard for me to help you if I don't know your entire code base, okay? So show me your code. Show me the error. Tell me about what you've tried doing. I've tried migrating my database. I'm still getting PG undefined. What's going on? This is what my code looks like, but I need more information. When you ask people for help, you need to give them information. Um, describe your approach. Like, I love when people are, like, this is what I think I'm going to try. What do you think of that, right? It's way easier for me to give you an opinion than just, like, debug your code. Um, like, ask more questions about your own problem. Again, the most common question I get is, why doesn't this work, right? I would ask things like, why am I getting the wrong return value? That's way more insightful to me than, like, why doesn't this work? Um, you have to be patient with people. Like, are, I mean, they're trying to help you, you know? Like, I've gotten yelled at by people as I'm trying to help them. Like, it's insane to me. Um, so please be patient with people that are trying to help you. Um, be thankful to them. And then finally, help other people, okay? Um, yeah, like, it's an awesome programming community, but if, you, if someone has helped you, you owe the universe back helping someone else. And I don't care how beginner at this you are, there's always someone that you are a little more advanced than that you can help, okay? And if you've asked for help from someone else, again, you just owe it to the world to help someone else, okay? Um, all right, staying motivated. So uh, every time you're learning something, every day, you don't know what you are currently learning. And it always feels like you're totally lost. But like two days ago, you learned something else. People tend not to look up the hill. 
we always feel like we don't know what's going on. And even though you've learned about methods and arguments and objects, and now you're in Rails land and you don't understand how Rails works, remember, you, at one point, you learned Ruby, right? Remember the battles you have fought and won. It is a great way to stay motivated. You are not, like, bad at this. You're just always confused. But that doesn't mean, like, you haven't made progress. You just can't remember the progress. Um, so uh, I also run, and uh, in, in the running community, we have a concept called my race, my pace. It's really hard when you're running, like my experience of running a race in New York is watching 30,000 people run faster than me because I can only see the people ahead of me and they're all running really fast. I don't care about their pace. It is my race, my pace. How fast other people learn is nothing to do with you. So you're in a free code camp chat, you're in the Slack chat, you see someone making a lot of progress, you're going to get really demotivated, don't think about them. Your, your life and their life are not the same. Um, this is a Sandy Metz quote. As long as you keep on learning, I can promise you one thing. You will never ever be as stupid as you are right now. Tomorrow you will be a little smarter, okay? <laughs> so just remember that. Like, it just, it only gets easier. It very rarely gets harder. Um, People are always like, you know, like, I've been working on this for four days, and I can't, I just got it working, that was such a waste of time. It wasn't. That is what learning feels like. Learning is a movement from, like, darkness to light, and until it clicks, it's all failure, and your failures don't matter, right? You just need to succeed. Like, the quote is, I think, um, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how many times you fail as long as it's one less times than you tried, right? As long as you keep trying, you will eventually get it working, and that's how you learn. Um, Google inspirational content. I mean, yeah, I watch a lot of stupid motivational videos on YouTube. I have a whole Google Doc about motivational content that I could just like give to students all the time. Um, so feel free to ever tweet at me if you need some like inspirato. Pretty good at it. Um, but yeah, like I don't know, like Google some inspirational stuff. It's it's you know a good way to stay motivated. Um, oh my God, don't learn alone. Just you know, you guys are all here, so you're already like you know keen on this one, but like. Yeah, being alone sucks. There's a lot of other people in the world that are trying to do exactly what you're trying to do. Get to know them. Be social. Stay. It's a great way to like stay um, committed to the process. Have friends. Go to meetups. Meet other programmers. Like, have buddies. It really, really helps. Um, yeah, and uh, I again, like, I just think that people tend to get really discouraged and then stop, and then two months later they wake up and they're like, I want to try again, and that's just so sad. You have to keep going because, as the rapper Common says, slow progress is better than none. Okay? All right. Um, people talk to me a lot about how they learn. And some people will be like, I'm a project-based learner. I'm a visual learner. I learn this way. That's all crap. You can only learn things in two ways. And this is what, there's a, a really famous educator, Piaget. I can't pronounce, I always mispronounce that name. What was it? Piaget. Piaget. That was, I was close. Um, and he, he says that basically all learning boils down to two things, accommodation of knowledge or assimilation of knowledge, which is to say, you have an idea of how something works, and then you design an experiment. Either it worked the way you thought it did, in which case you basically assimilate your knowledge, you're like, oh, confirmed, it works, or it doesn't work the way you thought it did, in which case you must accommodate your understanding, right? That's it. Project-based learning, visual learning, all the other kind of learning things consultants sell to people are just ways in which to get a student to either accommodate or assimilate knowledge. When you are learning, you want to have an idea of why you think something behaves that way or what it is. Then you want to confirm that and look for the feedback and change your process. That's it. Visual learning, labs, projects, reading is just a way of hitting accommodation or assimilation. The faster feedback cycle that you can create for yourself and how quickly you are accommodating or assimilating knowledge, the faster you'll learn, okay? Um, blogging is awesome. Writing about your journey. Like if there's something I don't understand, the first thing I want to do is write a blog post about it. I will basically Google the topic read 10 other people's blog posts, and then write my own version of it. It is a way of keeping track of what I'm learning. I'm putting you know, positivity and good stuff out there into the world. And again, when you have to verbalize something or write it down, you're going to understand it better. So if you don't blog yet, <laughs> blog. Just start a blog. I promise you, whatever you write that day is not the worst thing someone put out on the internet. Okay? <laughs> All right? 
You are never, ever the worst blogger on the internet on any given day. Um, again, like get a lot of perspectives. Like, uh, you know, sometimes I'll read one book on a topic and I'm just like, I don't understand it. And then someone else writes another book on the exact same topic. And for, one, for some reason, the way that they describe it clicks for me. So, yeah, just get a lot of different voices in your learning or, you know, in your process. Um, I, I, I believe in habit over motivation. Like, getting really fired up one day and getting like, you know, I'm going to go on this run, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to read this programming book, that's great for one day. Motivation is inconsistent, and if the only thing fueling you is inspiration or motivation, you're going to lose. You have to create habits, right? Motivation is really good at first, but then become routine, become consistent. Habit over motivation, right? You learn an hour a day, whether you like it or not, whether you make progress or not. I don't care if you just stare at your computer screen for an hour. Reserve the time and develop a habit. They say if you, can do any, if you do something for 30 days straight, you can basically do it for the rest of your life. That's your goal, okay? 30 days, whether it's 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, create a habit, okay? And then um, the guys that started KIPP, which is in charter school, they had a quote called, uh, work hard, be nice. That's their kind of motto. I love that. Um, I think that your goal is to basically work hard, be nice, stay positive, and then just simply have faith. It will work. You will not not be able to learn this, okay? There's nothing about you or your brain or your intelligence. I've watched, I've watched so many people learn how to program and like some of the best, some of our most you know, prestigious alums at this point that have amazing jobs, like I work on Ember, I work at Tilda, I work at Basecamp, they were not the best students, okay? You're gonna surprise yourself, but you have to keep on working hard, being nice to people, and just stay positive, okay? And then just believe that you will get to where you want to go. All right, I think that is it. How long was that? Um, it was like uh, 40 seconds. All right, that's not bad. Cool. All right. <laughs> hour 14. Hour 14? I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> that was way too long. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, I love feedback. Please tweet at me. Feel Always feel free to email me. People sometimes are like, I can't email Avi, he's like the founder of the school. You can totally email me. But also, be patient. I might take a few days to respond, okay? But uh, I love talking to people that are trying to learn. I love hearing about their process and what they're going through. So I am a resource. You can, you know, reach out to me. Any questions? Nothing? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I mean, um, let me just pull up this note because, again, like I'm a little OCD, and this is the only way I know how to get things working for myself, okay? Um, so, sorry, one second. All right. So this is uh, what I do when I want to do something. I just, like, I don't know, like, for me, like, I just can't mess around with myself. Like, oh, this isn't working. Why don't you drag? Go to the next screen. Yeah, maybe. Let's see. All right. Okay, and now, all right, cool. All right, so uh, that is my workout schedule for June. And I just stick to it. Like I write it down and I commit to myself that that's what I'm gonna do and it's aggressive and I would rather fail at that than not try at all. So like I, I like to set myself ambitious goals and if I can, I rarely ever will hit all of them but like getting 70% of an ambitious goal is way better than getting nothing of no goal. So like, I just, I'm disciplined, like I, my calendar, I reserve time to do all the things I want to do and if it's like, you know, flying or climbing or learning about nuclear physics or whatever, like I just make time for it. And then my, my first session, like when I, I love nuclear physics and like I can tell you how reactors work and all that and at first when I decided I wanted to learn how that works, the first hour session was literally me sitting down writing down all the questions I had. And then the next session was answering the first question and going to Google and going to YouTube and reading that. Like, that's it. Like, you just have to make a schedule and then you just stick to it. You go through the motions. You do that enough and it works. Just to trail off that question, like, you, you focus on this, like, one thing, like, at a time, like, the same Yes, like, absolutely. I only, I mean, one, this is my main thing, which is the school. Uh, there's not enough room in my life for too many other things. I do one other thing a year. Right? So like this year it's climbing, last year was nuclear physics, three years ago it was flying, that's it. Like I, something, I get, a, I get curious about something, I enjoy something, and then I make it my goal for that year. One thing at a time. 
because I have like a job too that I really love. <laughs> I'm sorry? You read outside the programming. Yeah, I, I, I have read almost every climbing book that has been published in the last six months. <laughs> I, can tell you, I, mean, I can tell you the history of climbing, who's like done every single first ascent. Like again, like for me, the way I fall in love with something is very much history and context. Like climbing, I, I love the physicality of it, like when I'm doing it, but like understanding the culture of it, the history of it connects me more to the topic and allows me like, even on when I have terrible climbing days, like, it keeps it more part of my life than just this one little thing. Um, so yeah, I read, I mean, again, like I, I like reading. I don't know why people are so like against books. Um, but yeah, I read really, really weird climbing books, like 50 Favorite Climbs, you know, The History of Everest, okay? Yosemite Valley and Camp Four, like, yeah, I don't know, I read, I read books, like I like that. But do you read the comics? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I have a Kindle, it's great, and I generally like, yeah, I mean, I. I uh, I have a Kindle. I, I like hard copies. Climbing books are better in hard copies because the pictures are really cool. So. Um, when you say the simulation, is that what you mean? So is that meant to hypothesis is being tested? So you have a hypothesis and you test it and then you adjust or you just Accommodate is when you have to adjust. Assimilate is when you actually, like, it was right and now the knowledge clicks in your head. Um, I mean, I guess one thing, I, I don't really try to memorize stuff, like, I find that if I just keep on doing it, it eventually, like, it's not memorization, it's just, like, routine at that point. Um, yeah, I don't know, when I have, when there's something I don't understand, I really try to vocalize what it is I'm not understanding as well as possible, then try to think about what is my current understanding, how can I test that, and then I go through the accommodation or assimilation process, right? Like, the high five moment, like, yes, it worked! And I knew it was going to work that way, and that was the exact thing I expected. That's what assimilation feels like. The, huh, what the shit? That's the accommodation process. Yeah, I have a question with regards to that. You mentioned that the reason why you like to do it is because Right, I mean, so, right, everything, you know, projects are great because they give you a lot of opportunities for accommodation assimilation. Watching people, getting like, um, one person, one time when someone told me that they're a, visual, they're a visual learner, so they like to watch lectures, that's not what visual learning means. Visual learning means that you have a graphic representation of a concept. Watching something is not, yes, when I read a book, I'm visual learning because all information comes in through my eyes, okay? <laughs> um, Visual, visual learning is really when you can create a visual metaphor for what you're trying to do. Um, what you said, the kinesthetic process of projects being tactile with stuff, like when I, when I describe like debugging as jumping into my program and imagining like a three-dimensional space where I can like really feel around, that is a, a kinesthetic process for learning something really abstract and not physical. Um, and again, like you have to experiment. I don't believe that people learn in one way. I believe we learn in a variety of ways. And all we're trying to do is create those moments to accommodate or assimilate knowledge. So try different things. Draw a graphic of something, right? Like draw boxes, stub things out. Try to feel around your code. Like I don't know why I feel programming is so like tactile to me, but like whatever you can do. Cool, that's it. Awesome, great, have a great weekend guys. Thank you so much. Thank you Yana for organizing this. <laughs>